A reading from Isaiah. I will recount the gracious deeds of the Lord, the praiseworthy acts of the Lord, because of all that the Lord has done for us, and the great favor to the house of Israel, that he has shown them according to his mercy, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he said, Surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely. And he became their savior in all their distress. It was no messenger or angel, but his presence that saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. The word of the Lord. A reading from Hebrews. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here I am and the children whom God has given me. Since therefore the children share flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared the same things, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For it is clear that he did not come to help angels, but the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, he had to become like his brothers and sisters in every respect, so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself was tested by what he suffered. He was able to help those who are, are being tested. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now after the wise men had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, 
and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated. He sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or younger, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. After being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene, the Gospel of the Lord. It is good to be with you again today. Um, I've been a pastor a long time, and I'm retired. So I'm always delighted to have an opportunity to be with, with someone to bring a message that is based on God's word. I will look at my watch, because when I give a sermon, I tend to get carried away and lose track of time. When I listen to sermons, I like a sermon that is short and sweet and to the point. (laughs) Not all of my sermons are. But if we can say in 15 minutes what can be said in 30 minutes and say it well, by the help of the Holy Spirit, it will bless you and me. So I would like to pray. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of the faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. We are celebrating the 12 days of Christmas. We live in a world that is all about celebrating Christmas as some kind of an experimental phenomenon uh, that invades our culture. I read an article in the newspaper a couple of days ago Uh, written by a gentleman named uh, Mr. Dion, L.J. Dion, Jr. He writes for the Washington Post. The title of his piece is A Reason to Remember What Christianity Should Be About. And he opens with, Christmas ought to remind us what the whole thing is about. By the whole thing, I mean Christianity, the enduring demands of Jesus, and the remarkable fact that 2,000 years later, so many are still captivated by the birth of a baby in a stable. He goes on to say a lot about how we have commercialized, we have taken advantage of the fact that we um, are encouraged to give, and everybody must give. And um, we are solicited from day till night about giving not only to each other, but to the great causes around us. So it is a season of giving. The giving season can also be lost in the midst of the true celebration of the birth of Jesus the Christ. So on Christmas, you got to hear the story according to Luke. Now Luke was a convert to Judaism. He was a very educated man. He was a a physician. He was a historian. So he gives us the story in the context 
of who was the emperor and who were the rulers at the time. So that his witness can be um, compared to the witness of the culture in which he lived. There are people who today say, oh, the Bible is an old book, you can't rely on it. There actually are more manuscripts to support the story of the Bible than any other ancient writing. So put that in your back of your mind, and, and if you wish to um, research it, please do so. So we heard the story of Christmas, the babe in the manger. I, my wife and I went, attended church at uh, Cross of Life in Roswell. There were lots of children. There were lambs and sheep. There were cattle and goats. There, were, there was a, a menagerie of things happening around the altar. There were songs of joy. Um, there were children playing and laughing, and it was a wonderful event. Um, in the past, I have um, struggled through Christmas Eve services. When you have three in a row and maybe one the following morning, I understand that you had five. Is that correct? Or four services? Go with four. All right. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> I understand why your pastor is taking a break. <laughs> I could no longer do that. I have, I have, um, ex my, my, I have expired in, in the sense of my time limits. Um, I can't do that. Today, however, the story kind of darkens. It reminds us that Jesus, the light of the world, came into the world, and the light shines in the darkness... And the darkness has not, cannot, and never will overcome it. But the reality of darkness is still there. Pick up your newspaper. Turn on the news for five minutes and tell me there's not a story of somebody killing somebody, a war that is going on. And one of the worst wars we've ever experienced is happening in Syria. Um, people are dying as we speak. Uh, there's a war happening in in, uh, in the Middle East, um, in Yemen. Uh, children are dying by the thousands, and it's happening now. We live in a dark world, but the light of Christ still shines. Now, next week, if you come back, we'll be reading from the Gospel of John, the last of the Gospels written, and uh, we'll read the, the prologue. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. God came to dwell with us. We celebrated in, 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 uh, in Matthew, we celebrated in Luke, we celebrated in John. Mark, however, skips all of that. He begins his gospel with the baptism of Jesus. So, dark days, Herod heard from the wise men who came a great distance following the star. They were astrologists. They were not actually kings, but probably priests of a Zoroastrian religion that believed in one God. They believed that God spoke to them in the signs and wonders of the heavens, and they followed a star. When I lived in Miami, uh, the planetarium there each year would put on a program called the Star of Bethlehem, and the director there maintained that there was a possibility of a conjunction of stars at that time, there actually was in history, that that could have been the star that the, the wise men saw and believed that it was God saying to them, go search for a king. Obviously, from the conversation they had with Herod, and Herod heard the words, another king, he was not pleased. He was furious. And the wise men didn't go back to let him know exactly where the child was so that, as he said, I could come worship the child. He wanted to kill him. He killed all the children in that little village two, up to two years and younger because he must have estimated the time it took the wise men to make the journey. Fury, anger, hatred, darkness. That's the world in which Jesus was born. His, his family took him. He became a refugee. We don't know the exact space of time between his birth and the coming of the wise men, but it was pretty close. He, his parents took him to Egypt and remained there until the angel again spoke to Joseph and said, it is safe to come back because Herod is dead. So, <clears throat> The thought that came to my mind as I was reading this passage, 
and that I thought I should share with you is that um, in God's economy, there's always hope. There's hope that in the midst of darkness, the light still shines, and that God makes a way where there is no way. Now, I thought I would give you some examples from my own experience, and I, in my dreaming and in my preparing, I had several, but they would take about 30 minutes, so I'm not doing that. I will, however, tell you one part of my life, and I'll save the next part for next week. It's a serial. <clears throat> I went to school in the south of Ireland in a little farming community called Castle Lyons in County Cork, not Cork, County Cork, and um, grew up there, three brothers and a sister, um, four of us all together. My dad worked a small farm. He worked very hard. He grew sugar beet. He grew barley, and he uh, raised some cattle and sheep and pigs. When I, I struggled in school as a youngster, because my older brother was also in the same classroom with me. He was a year and a half older and way smarter than me. So the teacher got wind of the fact that we were brothers and said to me, why can't you be like your brother? Why can't you be as smart as he is and as highly motivated? So I dug my heels in and didn't do well in school till I went on to secondary school and a teaching brother came in and he pulled me out of my shell. He was a godsend to a student who was failing. God sent Brother Hogan. He, uh, he, he loved his job. There was something about him that was different. He was a happy person. He treated everybody well with kindness and, and respect. <coughs> Um, he didn't notice that I wasn't as smart maybe as the other kids, but he knew that I was a human being. In the sight of God, I was valuable, and I be began to believe in myself. And I discovered that his motivation was his faith. He, didn't, he wasn't a Bible thumper, and he didn't boast about his faith, but it came out in his teaching. There was one, one phrase, and one phrase only that I remember from him. The phrase was, your worship is your life. And what he taught us was, when you come to church, you bring all the stuff of the past week. Your arguments, your impatience, your dishonesty, your greed, your anger, you bring it all with you, and hopefully we leave it all here at the foot of the altar. We confess. I, I, I would have to say that maybe, perhaps, we leave that space a little longer than we sometimes do. Uh, let it flow. Let God, God knows, but it's a good thing to tell him. It's a good thing to tell your spouse or your children if your offense has been against them. It's a good thing to tell a counselor or a pastor, get it off your chest, come clean. Jesus has come to save us from our sins. <clears throat> At age 17, I began to feel an inkling in my bones that God was calling me to ministry. I didn't think about the possibilities of raising money to go to seminary. I didn't think about the fact that my father was depending on me, the second son, to stay on the farm. My older brother, the successful one, the brainy one, went to medical school. I was not, an, I was not a candidate. I was a candidate for farming. <laughs> and so, you know, by the way, Amos the prophet, he says, I'm a farmer, leave me alone. I'm not, I, I wasn't called to be a... God has asked me to be a prophet, but I'm really only a farmer. So this is who you're listening to today as a farmer. But um, as I struggled with the whole concept, when I told my parents I thought I wanted to be a priest, they said the first question they said to me, being good Catholic parents, was, does anybody know what the question was? Do you have a, a calling? They called it vocation, which of course is the Latin word for calling. Do you have a vocation? I said, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> then they pulled the trick on me. A priest uh, friend coming back from Florida on vacation came to visit us, and we took him into the parlor, which is a very sacred place to go. We never went there except at Christmas time and when special people came. However, they dropped me off in the parlor and said, why don't you have a conversation with Father Vincent? And they walked away. The priest said to me, why do you want to be a priest? And I'm going, oh God, um, I, <laughs> I better have the right answer. I came up with, 
The harvest is great, but the laborers are few. He said, no problem, you're fine. Open the door, bring your parents in, he's good. <laughs> so as I grew close to finding a way to express myself and to prepare, I, I, um, I, I searched many channels. <clears throat> it had occurred to me that this can be a costly thing. You know, we know about college costs here in this country. One of our major issues is student loans. Uh, we didn't do student loans. Uh, we begged, borrowed, we didn't steal. <laughs> we worked hard. So there were two things bothering me, and I had to make a, had a conversation with God. This conversation went like this. God, if you're calling me away from my home and from my father, um, I'm worried about him. I'm worried about him being able to manage. He's in the 60s already. He, when, we, when he married my mother, he was 40 years old, and I'm the second son, and I'm 17, so do your math. So um, I said, not to my dad, but to God, I will go, but if my father is struggling and needs me, I will take that as a signal that that's where I need to be. Number two is the money issue. Well, after I met the priest from Florida, he said the bishops in the United States are looking for priests. They're recruiting priests in Ireland. I went to a seminary that um, educated priests for English-speaking places in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in Australia, in New Zealand. The, pre the bishops came and recruited us. I was adopted into the Diocese of Miami by Bishop Coleman Carroll, and he paid the major part of my college education. The, the rest of it was filled in by local trust funds given by the local people in the Diocese of Cashel and Emily, which is in County Tipperary. You've heard of that, haven't you? It's a long way. <laughs> <laughs> so, in a way, God made a way where there was no way. I want you when you leave this place today, to reflect, maybe while you're still here, to reflect on, in my life, have I seen God make a way where I thought there was no way? He did it for the child Jesus, for Mary and Joseph. He found the place, he, he, he guided them by the message of the angel, take the child away from the danger and take him to Egypt. Let him be the first refugee as a matter of fact, undocumented in a different country. And he will stay there until Herod dies. So God was watching over Jesus. There was, this was not the time for Jesus to die. That time would come later when he had fulfilled his mission of telling the people the story of God. God sent his son to reveal to us who God is. So that's why we're here today. And as I read the article in the newspaper, it was a kind of a downer that said the church is shrinking. Churches are closing. <clears throat> I just presided over a merger in, um, in Decatur about a year ago where two small churches came together. We're not able to afford our buildings. But you know what? The early church didn't have buildings. They met in their homes. Um, they were... They were growing like crazy after Pentecost and after the, the message of Peter uh, that this Jesus whom you crucified has risen for us and he has done, he has given his life as a sacrifice for us. He has given to God per perfect love, perfect life, perfect worship on behalf of us who are incapable of doing that. So, Paul would say that God made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's the message. That's the great exchange. Jesus said, I'll give you all of my stuff. You give me all of your stuff. We'll make a great exchange, and you will be pure, and you will be ready to enter that place. But there are no more tears, no more crying, no more death, no more fear. For Jesus came to save us from our sins. He makes a way where there is no way. Let us pray.
Lord Jesus, we have heard your word in the gospel. We appreciate the gift of the scriptures. We will honor them by reading them, by reflecting on them, by praying over them, by letting your spirit guide us and build us so that we become a strong church, no matter how small, strong, ready, blessed, and that the fruit of the spirit will be evident in us. The love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the gentleness will come forth from us, your chosen, blessed, and sent people. In Jesus' name, we pray and give thanks. Amen.